This recording is going to cover the general organization of the sympathetic nervous system as well as a little bit of the physiology. The um, specific effects on target structures will be covered at a different time. The sympathetic nervous system is one of the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. Now the targets for the autonomic nervous system are going to be visceral effectors. The effectors will include smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. And we'll go over the specific effects on, say you see this picture, picture of the sympathetic nervous system on these targets. But what I do first is I want to kind of mention the fact that when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, it involves preganglionic neurons and postganglionic neurons. So it's a two neuron system. The preganglionic neuron is located before a ganglion. And remember, a ganglion is a group of cell bodies located in the peripheral nervous system. And then we have a postganglionic neuron. Now, the sympathetic nervous system is, has, is referred to as the thoracolumbar division based on the location of the cell bodies of the preganglionic neurons. Now, thoracal, think thoracic, lumbar, think lumbar. It's here, it's called thoracal lumbar because the preganglionic neurons arise from the lateral gray horns of spinal cord segments. You'll notice here, T1 to L2. Now, T1 through L2, if you look at the sections of the spinal cord there, they're gonna have lateral gray horns. And remember, lateral gray horns contain visceral motor nuclei. So specifically, this is where the cell bodies of the preganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system is located. Now the um, preganglionic neurons are relatively, or I should say the axons of them are relatively short and they're lightly myelinated. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, the way we're, what's, what's going to happen, so I'll come over here, is I'm going to review some of the, the, the anatomy that we've talked about in the past and now specifically referring to what's going on in the autonomic nervous system. Now what you'll notice here in that, the, the section through the spinal cord, the light blue represents a lateral gray horn. So again, that's only located in spinal cord segments T1 all the way to L2. So T1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, L1, and L2. That's the location of visceral motor nuclei. The axons of these preganglionic neurons are, again, lightly myelinated, and they're going to exit out through, and I'm going to follow the light blue, out through the ventral root. and enter the spinal nerve. So here represents the spinal nerve. The spinal nerves, remember, pass through the intervertebral foramen, and they're gonna exit the, through the ventral rami. And so here again, here's the ventral ramus. I think doesn't wanna write. Some reason doesn't want to write it. It's an A ventral ramus. Here's the dorsal ramus, so I might as well label this. We'll talk about it in a second. So the axon will then exit from the ventral ramus to what we'll refer to as the sympathetic trunk via what we call here the white ramus communicons. Now the white ramus, there's a gray ramus and there's a white ramus communicons. We're a part of what we call collectively the rami communicantes. Rami communicantes literally means communicating branches. This, these are structures that are associated with the autonomic nervous system. Now, the white ramus communicons is only associated with spinal nerves T1 to L2. Okay, so you're only going to see that along with spinal nerves T1 to L2. The, the axons of these preganglionic neurons, which again are relatively short, they're lightly myelinated. They're gonna travel along this white ramus communicons. Now the 
it will travel and then synapse with a number of different ganglion and we have one of three options we're going to go through them um, very shortly now the um, one cool thing about the sympathetic nervous system is the preganglionic neurons may synapse with 20 or more postganglionic neurons if you compare that with the parasympathetic the parasympathetic only can synapse up to with four or five so it has mass effects you can get a lot of structures um, activated at the same time so the now what you'll notice here is I had mentioned that the preganglionic nerve fibers has one of three options of where it's going to synapse with the cell body of a postganglionic neuron one of the options which you see here is and this one is what we refer to as a sympathetic trunk ganglion which has cell bodies of postganglionic neurons and you'll see that you follow in black is those are axons of the postganglionic neurons now these axons are fairly long and they're unmyelinated so I'm going to mention long first so I'm going to go back let me go back here real quick is if you notice that the um, the ganglion uh, are relatively close to the spinal cord so the preganglionic neurons were short but in the sympathetic nervous system the effectors are a lot are pretty far away from these ganglions so those those axons are relatively long now they are I had mentioned they are unmyelinated and and again a way to remember is they travel along the gray ramus communicons and remember we had a discussion about white versus gray matter we can use that in their naming of these rami communicantes the white ramus communicons has lightly myelinated axons and remember white matter had it was and we're talking about the nervous system the central nervous system that had uh, myelinated axons the gray matter when we talked about the central nervous system is that was a location of cell bodies or unmyelinated axons so the axons of postganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system are not myelinated so they travel along the gray ramus communicons now the gray ramus communicons is going to be associated with every spinal nerve it's, it's located all along the segments of the spinal cord the reason for this is it's used to distribute the the axons to structures in the body walls and the limbs now I'll just give you an example you can if you look at the picture that that bl those black lines are can go down they can go up out here or here there's dorsal remus is say for example a target structure was say the, a blood vessel or structures associated with skin in your back it would travel along the dorsal ramus if it was a structure and we'll say a visceral target associated with your limbs or your anterior lateral body wall it will travel along the ventral ramus okay so the um, so I want to mention the location of various ganglion for the sympathetic nervous system you're only seeing one example here that preganglionic neuron doesn't necessarily have to synapse with one that you see here there's other options but we're going to look at our three options so again cell bodies of preganglionic neurons for the sympathetic nervous system are located in the lateral gray horns of spinal cord segments t1 to l2 hence again the name thoracal lumbar division those axons are relatively short they're lightly myelinated they're going to synapse with cell bodies of the postganglionic neurons located in various ganglion so we have a b and c we have three different options so we're going to go in order the first option for a is going to be referred to as your sympathetic chain ganglion another name for it is sympathetic trunk ganglion so sympathetic trunk ganglion and it also can be referred to as para vertebral ganglion 
because the reason why they call it the paravertebral, para literally means kind of long the vertebra, because remember that, um, or not remember, that these are structures, this, these sympathetic trunk ganglion are paired structures. They're located on both sides of the vertebral column, relatively nearby the vertebral column. Hence, that's another name for these type of ganglion. Now, the again, remember, but though that the gray rami communicons or contes, which is plural for um, gray, gray ramus communicons is singular, gray rami communicantes is plural. They're going to run throughout the length of the sympathetic chain and they're not restricted to T1 to L2. So we may need we may need to travel up, like you see here, like we may, this thing needs to go, you know, up this way or it can go down. So the preganglionic neurons can synapse with more than one cell body located in the sympathetic trunk ganglion. Now the postganglionic fibers um, will then travel again along the gray rami communicons and they're going to have target structures associated with it. We're going to write it. We're going to show you here. Is the target structures are so you don't have to specifically write these down because we're going to go over those a little bit later. Is target structures are visceral effectors in your head and neck. So like here you see these would be head and your neck. So visceral effectors in head and neck. So again, I say visceral effector, so it is a smooth muscle. Um, there's not gonna be cardiac muscle up in, in the head and neck, but smooth muscle or glands, okay? So smooth muscle, like you see, associated with the eye, salivary glands, so head and neck. You also have target structures in the thoracic cavity, like you see, for example, the heart and the lungs. And also, what you'll notice over here are structures associated with your skin. I'm just going to abbreviate associated with the skin, such, say, for example, um, sweat glands, um, erector pili muscle, those would be examples. And also another target would be blood vessels. Okay, so the sympathetic trunk ganglion those, those axons are going to innervate structures up in the head and neck, structures in the thoracic cavity, and structures associated with your skin as well as blood vessels. And we're going to go over specifically kind of what, they're going to, what the effects will be at a later time. Now the other option is for you see for B is we could involve something referred to as collectively collateral ganglion. So collateral ganglion are unpaired structures that are going to have the, the um, cell bodies of postganglionic neurons. Now, overall, collateral ganglion are going to be um, innervating structures in the abdominal pelvic cavity. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over specific examples of collateral ganglion. So we have three of them. Now, kind of as a rule of thumb, is when we look at the sympathetic trunk ganglion, is use your diaphragm as your cutoff. So things in your in your body cavities that are above the diaphragm, that's going to be sympathetic trunk. Things below it will be collateral ganglion. Okay. So what you'll see here, and this is kind of similar to what you saw with the other one, is you have a the section through the spinal cord, and you're actually looking at from underneath. So again, you've got the lateral gray horns where the preganglionic neurons are. These axons will travel out through that white ramus communicons, and here it keeps going and eventually goes out to these collateral ganglion. Now, the collateral ganglion are we're going to have the cell bodies of postganglionic neurons. Now, we have three different types or three different names. The first one is referred to as the celiac ganglion. Now the ciliac ganglion are going to be targeting structures in the upper abdominal cavity. So stomach would be one. Your liver in the gallbladder is another. And your pancreas and your spleen. Okay, so those would be structures innervated by the ciliac ganglion. The, another example of a collateral ganglion is referred to as the superior mesenteric ganglion. 
So the superior, so you notice I have a superior and an inferior mesenteric ganglion. So superior, this is going to be higher up. So superior mesenteric is going to be structures um, not quite as high as the ciliate ganglion, but it's going to be structures higher than what is innervated by the inferior mesenteric ganglion, and specifically small intestine and the first couple segments of the large intestine. So here and here. So this here is referred to as the ascending colon. This here is the transverse colon. So it's the first couple segments of your large intestine. The inferior mesenteric ganglion is your last example of a collateral ganglion. That's going to be innervating the terminal segments of the large intestine. More in this area here, the sigmoid colon, rectum area. The all other place is going to be structures in the pelvic cavity. So that would include um, bladder, um, internal reproductive organs, sex organs, um, and but also it will innervate the kidneys and external genitalia. So in the male you have this, this would be external genitalia. So we have ciliate ganglion, which are targeting liver, gallbladder, stomach, spleen, thing, and, and pancreas, things that are pretty high in the abdominal cavity. Superior mesenteric is small intestine and the first two parts of the large intestine. Inferior mesenteric ganglion, you're going more inferior abdominal cavity and then in your pelvic cavity, and in some examples, external genitalia because they're not in the cavity anymore. Now the last option where we're going to have cell bodies of postganglionic neurons would be what we see at C and that would be the adrenal medulla. Well actually the adrenal medulla is this interior part of the adrenal glands. This outer part is actually referred to as the adrenal cortex. That's going to be producing hormones that you'll talk about if you take um, uh, AMP2. But the adrenal medulla is actually a modified sympathetic ganglion. That what has happened is that the, the um, dendrites and the axons of these um, postganglionic fibers have kind of gotten really small. And eventually what's happened is these specialized neurons actually secrete hormones into the bloodstream. And they secrete norepinephrine, which is abbreviated as NE. I'll spell it out for you. Norepinephrine. And it secretes epinephrine, which is abbreviated as capital E. This is what it's spelled. Most of what's released by the adrenal medulla is epinephrine. Epine norepinephrine and epinephrine have very similar effects. But in this case, these are actually hormones. They will travel in your bloodstream, and their effects are going to be much more widespread than if we had direct innervation by, a, say, a nerve fiber. Is the targets, oops, go back here. The targets, which you see what we, you'd put in three, multiple targets. Similar targets as what you put in one and two. As long as there's a blood supply there and there's a receptor for that, particular hormone, you'll have an effect. So you're going to see a multitude of effects from what's released by the adrenal medulla. Now what I'm going to do is kind of like the basic physiology of the sympathetic nerve system and go back to this preganglionic, postganglionic neurons and give you a little bit more in depth what's going on. So the the preganglionic fibers are what you see is labeled C. They're cholinergic. So if something's referred to as cholinergic, it releases acetylcholine. So these, all these, I'm going to just color them in black here. This is acetylcholine, which I'm going to abbreviate is ACH. They release acetylcholine, and the receptors on the postganglionic neurons, the cell bodies, the postganglionic neurons, you see is labeled as N. Those are nicotinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors are ligand-gated sodium channels. So when acetylcholine binds to those receptors, cause opening of sodium channels, causes depolarization, and ultimately, hopefully, the generation of an action potential. 
that action potential are going to travel down that postganglionic neurons. And you notice they're labeled as A. That's because these fibers are adrenergic. And something that has an adrenergic fiber, they release norepinephrine. So I'm going to color in norepinephrine as green. So this would be norepinephrine. And most fibers of the sympathetic nervous system are adrenergic fibers. They will bind to their receptor on their target structure. And the receptor, which you see kind of here and here and here, those are going to be referred to as adrenergic receptors. And there's different types of them, and we're going to go more in depth. So, but we're just going to generally refer to them as adrenergic receptors. Now, the reason why you see, see that it's referred to as adrenergic is norepinephrine used to be referred to as noradrenaline. Epinephrine used to be referred to as adrenaline. And that's in the English still utilize the term adrenaline versus noradrenaline. So, um, noradrenaline bound to adrenergic receptors. So, that's where the, the name came from. Now, again, remember that these preganglionic neurons, which you see here, those fibers are short. The axons of postganglionic neurons, which you see here, are relatively long. Now, postganglionic fibers, I mentioned of the sympathetic division, most of them are adrenergic fibers. But in some cases, the postganglionic neurons are cholinergic, so they release acetylcholine. And you'll see that in some ves blood vessels in your skeletal muscles, as well also in, that'll be very important later when we talk about sweat glands. And in some instances, we do have some that are nitroxidergic, which means they release nitric oxide. But we're predominantly going to be talking about adrenergic fibers, and we will also mention the innervation of sweat glands later. Now, the bottom picture is representing what you see here, this is supposed to represent the adrenal medulla. So again, preganglionic neurons are releasing acetylcholine, which you see here. The receptors on the adrenal medulla are nicotinic receptors. That's going to result in release of epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. So these are these this modified sympath sympathetic gang are actually hormone producing cells. They will travel in your bloodstream and find their target. Ultimately you'll get where the R stands for is response. And the response can be excitatory or inhibitory depending on the specific specific receptor located in that target organ. Now the um, adrenergic receptors, so all of these are at, representing adrenergic receptors here, they will bind either norepinephrine or epinephrine, okay? So the adrenergic receptors are referred to as metabotropic receptors. They're not ionotropic, they're not ion channels. They elicit their effects indirectly is when, say, the neuro, in this case, say norepinephrine, bound to its receptor. These receptors are actually G protein coupled receptors, and indirectly, they will affect ion channels. They don't necessarily always open channels, they can close channels. So they will have effects on their targets depending on what specific adrenergic receptor and what its second messenger system does. So here, you'll notice I've listed a number of different adrenergic receptors. Alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2, beta-3. Now, to try to make it a little bit easier on you, to make it a little bit um, easier to remember certain things, is alpha-2, I won't talk about. So I'm never going to give you an example of something on a target that's alpha-2, so you can forget that. The beta-1 adrenergic receptors, the only one thing I'm going to talk about with this one is in the heart. So if I'm talking about cardiac muscle or um, the cardiac conduction system, 
the receptors for epinephrine and norepinephrine or beta-1 adrenergic receptors. Beta-3, only example, is adipose tissue. And then that leaves you with alpha-1 and beta-2. Now, alpha, what you'll notice with the 1s versus the 2s is the 1s are always excitatory or stimulatory. The 2s are always inhibitory. So um, alpha-1, we're going to show you a lot of tissues that have alpha-1. But for example, if that, if say norepinephrine um, caused say smooth muscle in that target to contract, that's an excitatory effect. So that has to have an alpha-1 adrenergic receptor. If it caused say that smooth muscle to relax, that would have to have a beta-2. Okay, so that's how you can kind of remember it. So if it's, we're talking about the heart, I'm going to say beta-1. We're talking about adipose tissue, we're going to talk about beta-3. The alpha-1 and beta-2, we're going to see a number of different targets with those, but alpha-1 will always have excitatory effects on that target. Beta-2 will have inhibitory effects, okay? So um, we're going to go over a lot of different targets a little bit later. Now, one last thing I do want to mention, though, mainly this thing about um, divergence is... As remember, I had mentioned that the sympathetic nervous system, a preganglionic neuron, can synapse with up to about 20 postganglionic neurons. And so you can have simultaneous activation of a number of different structures at the same time because it exhibits what we call divergence. I also do want to mention that the effects of the sympathetic nervous system are longer lasting than when we talk about the parasympathetic nervous system. Norepinephrine and epinephrine are going to um, take a little bit longer to be broken down than, for example, with acetylcholine. Now, the hormones released by the adrenal medulla are going to um, intensify and prolong any effects of responses really caused by norepinephrine released by postganglionic neurons. The reason for that is the epinephrine and norepinephrine released by the adrenal medulla, they don't have as many, we don't have as many um, enzymes to break those, those things down and say we have it synaptic clefts. So we, that, that'll make it um, prolong a little bit more. Now we need to terminate effects. So I do, have got, I do want to mention one more thing is how do we terminate the effects of the sympathetic nervous system? Well, the in this case I hear norepinephrine released by a um, postganglionic neuron into the synaptic cleft. The neuron could just take it back up. So we never even did anything, just take it back up. But we also have enzymes that will break down things like epinephrine or norepinephrine and then other things. So what you'll notice is the COMT, catechol-O-methyltransferase, that is an enzyme that degrades epinephrine and norepinephrine, but it also breaks down dopamine. And the reason why I want to mention that, because you may encounter this some point in your life, is there are certain medications given you are given to people with Parkinson's disease. They're these COMT inhibitors which are given to these people. And the reason why it's given to them is people with Parkinson's disease don't have sufficient levels of dopamine. And they're being given levodopa, which is kind of replacing the dopamine. And if you inhibit the breakdown of dopamine, in this case, levodopa, it increases the bioavailability of it. So it kind of prolongs the effects of it in those people. So people with Parkinson's are often given COMT inhibitors because this is an enzyme that also breaks down dopamine. Now a monoamine oxidase enzyme oxidizes uh, br or it breaks down norepinephrine and epinephrine, but also something called serotonin. And you may have heard of people who are given MAO inhibitors, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, that is often given to people with depression and because it's trying to um, help with the serotonin levels in these individuals. Now, an important thing to, to realize, and I should say with any medication, is 
lots of times people have to worry about um, how it's going to be affected with um, if they're taking other meds or certain foods. And people who are, who are on MI, um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors who are being treated with depression, they have to watch their intake of foods or um, beverages that have high amounts of something called pyramine. And what would happen if they ingest these certain foods or drinks, which include things like animal liver, um, fermented things like aged cheese and alcohol, they should not be drinking alcohol in any way, shape or form if you're on these, is it can lead to a hypertensive crisis because it's going to raise their blood pressure quite a lot because it increases norepinephrine levels. So that's something too that they need to be aware of. And I just want you to be aware of that. So this is going to be the end of talking about the introduction to the sympathetic nervous system. We'll talk about specific effects of the sympathetic nervous system on, say, the heart, the eye at a later date.